Hi. So I want to welcome Michael Friedman. You all know him. He graduated in class 49 in 2015. Michael jumped in with both feet from the very beginning and he got rookie of the year in 2015. So I, um, he's going to talk about Macrocystis pyrifera, the giant kelp, to give you just a little bit of history. Uh, several months ago, the Riviera Garden Club called PVIC and asked us if one of our docents would give them a presentation. I called Michael, Michael called them, and this subject came up. Then after his presentation, we got a call one day from the Riviera Garden Club and they were raving about this presentation. So I'd like to introduce Michael Friedman. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I hope to be able to tell each of you a little bit more about the uh, Macrocystis periphera uh, or giant kelp than what we learned in class and what we've picked up as we've gone along. I think most of the information, if not 100% of it is correct. But if somebody knows something that I say that is incorrect, please let us all know because the idea is to let everyone get information, particularly about the giant kelp that they don't know already. The richest habitat among the, along the California Rocky Shore is the kelp forest. Giant kelp is the largest and fastest growing of all seaweeds and forms the framework of the kelp forest community. It attracts and influences many other species of animals and plants within the forest. Later, when it tears loose as drift kelp, it provides large quantities of food for animals living on the seashore as well as on the ocean bottom. Despite its appearance, it is not a plant. It is a brown alga. It is the largest of all algae. The stage of life that is usually seen is called the sporophyte. And I'm just gonna spell that out for you, hopefully, if I can, so that you'll have it. Uh, let me try again. Uh, there we go. Excuse me, squirrel fight. I don't see it on my computer. Oh, wait, That's there it not... is. Okay, let me try it again. Let me try once more. And you should start the slideshow again. What do you want me to do? Uh, start the slideshow from beginning. Or oh, from... oh, sorry. One slide. There you go. Up, oh, go down. Okay, one. can you see this, the word sparrow fight at the top? I don't know if everybody can see it, but it's there. It's, it's there uh, right where his name is, where Michael is. Where it says Michael. Forget Michael. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is the stage of the life cycle that is usually seen. It is perennial, and individuals persist for many years. It is important because it is the foundation of temperate coastal ecosystems. They are nurseries for adjacent marine ecosystems. They filter runoff water and they hold sediments in place. <clears throat> Giant kelp is common along the coast of the Eastern Pacific from Baja, California to Southeast Alaska. And also in Peru, Chile, Argentina, Tasmania, and New Zealand. Individual algae grow at the rate of as much as two feet per day. Now, when I was in class and started out as a docent, I was told by some people that it grew as much as three feet a day, 
Somebody said four feet a day, <laughs> but according to my research, the true size of its growth is two feet per day in ideal situations. Giant kelp is a perennial kelp with the hold fast surviving four to 10 years and the individual fronds six to 12 months. Giant kelp clings to a rock foundation by means of its hold fast, which sole purpose is to anchor the plant to a rock. It does not provide a proper root system. The hold fast is a cone shaped mass made up of branching extensions called haptera. And that, rather than write it out, I'm just going to spell it because so you can see it. H A P T E R A, haptera. Numerous stem like types, often four to five in times dichotomously divided near the base, arise from a hold fast and are tough but flexible, allowing the kelp to sway in the ocean currents. Along with the stipe, blades occur at regular intervals. The thallus, or body, of giant kelp consists of flat or leaf-like structures called blades. The holdfast is unlike the root system of a plant. It does not carry nutrients or water. It only anchors the kelp to a rock. Nutrients and water are absorbed across the body walls. Gas-filled bladders called pneumatocysts, that's spelled P-N-E-U-M-A-T-O-C-Y-S-T-S, pneumatocysts, form at the base of the blades and help keep the thallus upright and close to the surface of to the surface of the water near the sun to aid in pro, uh, photosynthesis. Some plants are so tall that the upper blades spread across the top of the water to form a dense canopy. Often, many plants attach and grow together at forming a unique habitat called the cup forest. Growth occurs with the lengthening of the stipe and the splitting of the blades. As the growing tip is a sink at the excuse me, at the growing tip is a single blade at the base of which develops small glass bladders along one side. As the bladders and stipe grow, grow small tears develop in the attached blades. Once the tears have completed, each bladder supports a single separate blade along the stipe with the bladders and their blades attached at irregular intervals. The blades of giant kelp, especially mature blades that are near the surface, have the highest photosynthetic rates and the holdfasts have none. The stipes attached to the blades contain sieve tubes. These are structures that transport the products of photosynthesis and minerals in a manner analogous to the move movement of sap in vascular plants. Though use of this, through the use of the sieve tubes, excess photosynthetic products can move down to the dimly lit basal portions of the algae where these products are needed. From the hold fast to the tip of the largest frond of the frond, the giant kelp may reach lengths of 200 feet, with 100 feet growing from the hold fast to the surface and another 100 feet uh, stretched out in the canopy. Giant kelp prefers depths less than 120 feet, temperatures less than 72 degrees. Fahrenheit, hard substrate such as rocky bottoms, and bottom light intensities above 1% of the surface. Giant kelp often grows in turbulent water, which brings renewed supplies of nutrients. 
since the giant hill is not a plant, it does not have roots. Instead, it obtains all its necessary nutrients directly from the water. Like plants, however, the giant kelp harvests the sun's en energy through ph photosynthesis and does not feed on other organisms. Once, the, once an individual giant kelp reaches the sea surface, it continues to grow horizontally forming in large mats that shade the water column and the seafloor below. Giant kelp lives on average for six to eight years. Is there a question somebody have? For six to eight years, the structure of the kelp forest is very dynamic and can change rapidly depending on factors such as storms, weather, temperature, and herb Herbivory. Michael? This, yes? Can you explain, I didn't get to hear it real well, um, your explanation about the seed tube comparing it to sap? Yes, yes, let me repeat that. If I can find it here, just one second. One moment, please. I... Oh, here we are. Through the use of the, uh, let, me, let me start that again. Okay. The blades of the giant kelp, especially mature blades that are near the surface, have the highest photosynthetic rates, and the holdfasts have none. That's because they're so far away from the light. The stipes attached to the blades contain sieve tubes, which are structures that transport the products of photosynthesis and minerals in a manner analogous to the sap in vascular plants. Through the sieve tubes, excess photosynthetic products can move down to the dimly lit basal portions of the algae where these products are needed. Michael, are we supposed to be able to uh, see other pictures or is it just one picture? It's just the one picture. I'm sorry, I did not, I did not put in a lot of pictures. Uh, and these pictures are thanks to Miss Zellers. And I appreciate it because I had no pictures. I just had a bunch of words. As I was saying, giant kelp live, lives on average six to eight years. The structure of the kelp forest is very dynamic and can change rapidly depending on factors such as storms, weather, temperature, and herb, herb ivory. That's the, the eating of the plants by different animals. The species will often die back to its holdfast each winter as much as three quarters of an individual can be lost during the winter season. Individuals can also die due to sediment accumulation or herbivory where creatures burrow too far into the haptera, eventually weakening the holdfast. When the holdfasts are weakened, they are most likely to be torn from the rock, rocky substances uh, during storms and may in turn entangle themselves in the forest canopy, ripping out other individuals in the process. When present in large numbers, giant kelp form kelp forests that are home to many marine species that depend upon the kelp directly for food and shelter or indirectly for, as a hunting ground for prey. Several species of sharks, bony fish, lobsters, squids, and other invertebrates are known to live in or near the kelp forest. Both, are lar both the large size of the kelp 
and the large number of individuals significantly alter the availability of light, the flow of ocean currents, and the chemistry of the ocean water in the area where they grow. And it, I, I think everybody understands. Any questions so far? Any other questions? Okay. Well, Michael, uh, yes. one question from the screen. Uh, in your research, did you find that the sea otters sleep in the canopy? Yes, and I'll get to the sea otters in a moment. An additional way that kelp provides food for communities is through the rafts of torn blades and stipes that are blown ashore, providing food for the beach community, and rafts that sink, providing nourishment to benthic communities, that's the communities of, of life at the bottom of the sea. On the beach, nematodes, amphipods, fly larvae, decomposing bacteria and fungi will feast on washed ashore algae mats and reduce the mass to a heap of detritus and dissolved organic matter in a few days. Waves and tides will often return huge amounts of the organic matter to the sea, releasing nutrients into the water and providing food for suspension, feeding creatures and other animals. Pieces of decomposing kelp can also sink to the depths of the ocean, providing nutrients for deep sea creatures. Giant kelp has a multitude of inhabitants, including invertebrates graze on the blades, fish seek shelter in the dense forest, and thousands of invertebrates live in the holdfast, such as brittle stars, sea stars, anemones, sponges, and tunicates. Sea otters like to hunt in the kelp forest where they find their favorite food and can wrap up in the kelp to keep from drifting away. Unfortunately, it is estimated that the Palos Verdes Peninsula has lost approximately 75% of its giant kelp canopy. This causes, the cause, causes include landslides, sedimentation development, urban runoff, storms slowing kelp growth, and overfishing resulting in the loss of urchin uh, predators. This allows purple urchins, a dominant kelp herbivore, to overrun the reef and devour the remaining kelp. Uh, I think a lot of us have learned or heard that at some point in time, the sea otters were removed from Southern California waters. Uh, for those that want to know more about it, this is the information that I was able to find. In 1986, Congress established the No Otter Zone, put in quotation marks, N-O, No Otter Zones, as part of a plan by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to translocate sea otters to San Nicolas Island to establish a second population. At the time, the agency suggested the translocation program would aid in the recovery of the California sea otter, protected as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. The No Otter Zone was established by Congress in response to complaints from fishermen that moving the otters to a move location could interfere with their fishing activities. Many relocated otters swam back to their waters of origin. Others died as the result of being captured or transported. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service ultimately determined that enforcing the no otter zone was hurting the sea otter's recovery chances. In 2003, the agency determined again that eliminating the zone and allowing the otters to expand to their natural historical range south of Point Conception was necessary to achieve recovery 
of the species. Well, the sea, California sea otter population has rebounded from historical lows. The species remains threatened by pollution, disease, and competition with fisheries. The California sea otter population is, to believe, is believed to have been between 14,000 and 16,000 animals before the uh, fur traders arrived. And in recent years, it has hovered around 6, 000, uh, 3,000 animals. That's not very many. Sea otters love to live in the kelp beds. Otters love to eat the sea urchins and the abalone. One of the results of the removal of the otters was that the population of the purple sea urchin exploded. This resulted in the destruction of much of the kelp forests in the area. Removing the sea urchins has, is a difficult proposition because of various laws, but conservation groups and organizations have devised ways to reduce their excessive populations and the kelp forests are returning. And we had a program a couple of years ago at night where one of the conservation groups came and explained how they were getting rid of, of the sea urchins. And it was an interesting program, which I'm not gonna go into now, but they would swim down to the bottom of the ocean with hammers and knock off a large percentage of the uh, sea urchins, leaving a small percentage there for a natural life, but got rid of the excess. Giant kelp dampens surge, thereby providing essential shelter for many species of adult fish and serving as a nursery for juveniles as well. Studies have shown that in California, up to 100 species of fish are dependent on the giant kelp forest. The giant kelp is the easiest of kelp to harvest for several reasons. The fact that it's found in deep water habitat allows large harvesting boats to operate more easily. The surface canopy can be harvested several times a year without disturbing the submerged vegetative and reproductive parts, which are located below the harvesting levels, thus ensuring the kelp will continue to reproduce and the surface canopy will regenerate by the younger fronds growing below the surface. In California, 100,000 to 170,000 wet tons of kelp are harvested each year. I'll say that again, 100,000 to 170,000 uh, wet tons are harvested each year. Commercial harvesting in California is highly regulated to protect our kelp forests from improper or over-harvesting. Kelp harvesters are permitted to cut only the upper four feet of the water column. This regulation is to limit damage to the kelp's reproductive structures and allows vegetative regrowth from the unharvested fronds below the surface of our plants. The kelp cutters Cut the canopy in a strip of eight meters wide. Modern harvesters carry as much as 550 metric tons of kelp, which can be collected in a single day of harvesting. Alginic acid, also called algin, is a polysaccharide distributed widely in the cell walls of brown algae that is hydrophilic and forms a vicious gum when hydrated. With metals such as sodium and calcium, its salts are known as alginates. Algin has countless uses. In the food industry, it is used in many foods. Now we've all learned about this in general. This is gonna give you a little bit more specific information. In ice cream, sorbet, yogurt, and other dairy products, algin is used as a thickener. 
as a gelling agent, algin is commonly used to give jam, pudding, and pastry filling a gel-like texture. Algin helps prevent separation of ingredients as a stabilizer in gravies, soups, and sauces. It can also similarly be used as an emulsifier, which helps blend together substances that don't normally mix, for instance, such as oil and vinegar and salad dressing. And it's not just a not just for human food. Algin is often used to give pet food its texture as well. Since it's a foaming agent, algin can also be used in beer to help maintain its head. Algin is used in frozen foods for its stabilizing properties to assure smooth texture and uniform thawing. Now that was in the food industry. In cosmetics, Algin is used to create a gel coating in face masks. It is also found in many other cosmetic products like shampoo and lotion as well. In lipstick, algin is used to help maintain a smooth texture that stays on the lips. A unique medical purpose for a certain type of algin, calcium algin, has been found for wound dressings. The fibers are observed and take in fluid, creating a moist healing environment that can also be rinsed away with a saline solution for easy removal. The dental field has multiple uses for algin as well. Dental molds, molds use it as a gelling agent and it also acts as a thickener creating the texture and bringing the ingredients in toothpaste. One of Algen's most common applications is in manufacturing. It is used often as a thickener for textile dyes, which can help give a more precise application of the color onto the fabric. In fact, the textile industry accounts for about 50% of algin use worldwide. It is similarly used in paint for thickness and to stabilize the mix of pigments. In paper manufacturing, paper may be given a coating containing algin to give it a smooth surface. Moving on, this is a, a question that was asked of me at, when I spoke to the Plant Society, and I had to do some special research, and that is, how does kelp propagate? The way kelp actually reproduces is interesting. The mature strands of kelp that make up the kelp beds do not produce eggs and sperm at all. Instead, they produce an intermediate stage, microscopic spores produced by special blades without floats near the hole fast at the base of the adult kelp. Spores are different from seeds because they are single cells and only contain half of the chromosomes of the adult. They will mature and produce they will mature and produce either sperm or eggs. Seeds, on the other hand, are multicellular and are already fertilized, containing a full set of chromosomes. They are ready to produce an adult plant as they mature. If they aren't eaten or smothered by sand or otherwise destroyed, the spores settle on the bottom and grow into microscopic male and female forms called gametophytes. The females produce eggs and the males produce and release sperm into the water. The sperm find and fertilize the eggs by detecting chemicals called pheromones, 
released by the female gametophytes. Once fertilized, the egg develops into a sporophyte that takes over the female gametophyte. The sporophyte eventually grows to form the huge, large fronds that many meters tall that we recognize as kelp. Giant kelp has specialized blades clustered immediately above the hole fast that produce huge numbers of haploid male and female spores. A single blade can produce up to 500,000 spores an hour. The spores are propelled by two flagella and often settle within a few meters of the release. Uh, any questions about propagation? Predators. A plethora of predators feed on giant kelp, including turban snails, red sea urchins, purple sea urchin, north kelp crab, bat stars, sand beach isopods, and concave isopods. Sea urchins normally eat pieces of kelp that fall to the seafloor. However, during population surges, they will feed on stipes and hold fast of giant kelp and can completely destroy a kelp bed. Sea otters, if they were there, would help preserve the kelp forest by feeding on the urchins. The natural phenomena, El Nino, cycles warm tropical water from the South Pacific to the North Pacific waters. This has been known to kill off giant kelp due to the need for cold waters it would usually find in the North Pacific Ocean. In, in California, El Nino also brought along a population bloom of the purple sea urchins which feed on the giant kelp. Long distance dispersal of giant kelp is believed to occur via drifting sporophytes. Drifting sporophytes, which are known as kelp rafts, rafts, R-A-F-T-S, are created following sporophyte detachment, excuse me, from benthic substrates. In California, this occurs primarily during the winter months, November to February, kept afloat by numerous pneumatocytes. Giant kelp sporophytes may remain alive and adrift for more than 100 days. Zoospore germination rates remain fairly high even after several months of floating. Pieces of de de decomposing kelp called detritus can either sink to the depths of the ocean or get washed ashore, providing food for the deep sea animals or intertidal marine life, respectively. California sea lions, harbor seals, sea otters, and whales may feed in the kelp or escape storms or predators in the shelter of the kelp. On rare occasions, great whales have been spotted seeking refuge in the kelp forest from predatory killer whales. All larger marine life, including birds and mammals, may retreat to the kelp during storms or high energy regimes because the kelp helps to weaken the currents and the waves. Uh, that's my presentation on the kelp. I will answer questions. Uh, I have a list that I got from the um, one of the um, mu uh, museums of the different animals that are commonly found in the kelp forest here in Southern California. I'll read the list real fast uh, because I don't want to go into it right now, 
but this is certainly not a complete list. But in alphabetical order, Abalone, Bat Star, Boccaccio, California Scorpion Fish, California Sea Lion, California Spiny Lobster, Garibaldi, Giant Kelpfish, Giant Sea Bass, Giant Sea Anemone, Harbor Seal, Hermit Crabs, Horn Sharks, Kelp Bass, Leopard Sharks, Masking Crab, Moray Eel, Norris Top Snail, Purple Sea Urchins, Red Sea Urchins, Sargo, Southern Sea Otter, Swell Sharks, Western Gulls, and White Sea Bass. And yes, I said Western Gulls. The seals are found in, this, in the kelp forest, not under the water, but at the top. Okay, I'm ready for questions and comments and corrections. Michael? Yes. Michael, Michael can you hear me? Yes. Um, where would we see kelp harvesters? Um, anywhere where there's a kelp forest. I well, believe, like Catalina, I believe we see them out in, in the, you know, out in the har in the harbor, uh, outside the museum, between here and Catalina, we see some some boats that don't look like fishing boats, um, and they don't look like like whale watch boats, but I'm not sure what they whether what they are. I don't know just when they go and how they go, but they certainly are there and collecting, you know, a lot of the uh, kelp. And of course, whatever is floating, uh, that extra 50 feet or five, uh, is certainly, or 100 feet, is certainly uh, there to be taken and it's not gonna hurt the plant, or I should say the kelp. Any other oh, comments? Michael. Yes. Yeah, I, this is Pat Parker. I remember seeing a Huell Hauser program on kelp harvesting a while ago, and I think he was in the San Diego area. Yes, they, there was a big, a big company out of San Diego that was doing most of the harvesting, but they stopped doing it about I'm guessing about 10 years ago. Uh -huh. So at this time, I don't know that there are any large commercial harvesters out there. I think it's just individual individuals that harvest a little bit at a time. That when I say a little bit, I mean one one shipload or two shiploads a week or something like that. But it's still a multi-billion dollar industry. But a lot of the kelp. That, that is harvested <coughs> is not just the giant kelp, but is the, the kelp from other oceans and other types of kelp, because the kelp has the algin. It's not just the brown kelp, the giant kelp, but it's the giant kelp that is the easiest to harvest. Michael? Yes. This is Susan. Can you please, um, Maybe you have a book already that's in the um, gift shop or a list of the correct uh, scientific spellings of all of those names that you get rattled off so beautifully uh, <laughs> that I can't write that fast. And right, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make it, I'll make it a deal with you. Um, our, <laughs> Our editor of the Point and Co is getting ready to come out with the next uh, edition of the Point and Co for November. I will send her a list of all the terms and words that I used with the correct spelling. So it will be in the Point and Co for next month. Thank you. Then we don't have to worry about books and everything else. Anybody that's interested can look up the terms and find the definitions for themselves and just what they are. Thank you very much. Sure. Michael, um, yes. this is Bob Fenton. Um, 
I'm curious, is it, because it's sort of plant-like, but it's not really a plant. It's uh, not a plant. But it's, it's not, algae. so is it, is it, a, so is it a considered an animal then? No. No, it's, it's an algae. It's an algae. <laughs> <laughs> Algaes are not plants and they're not animals. Oh, Bob. They're their own thing. Okay. Uh, no. They've, the you biology get has scientifically involved in that. You've got to get somebody else to tell you about it. I don't know more than that. Susan said something. Listen, what did Susan say? Biology has expanded beyond animals and plants. There are bacteria, archaea, animals, plants, and protista. And protista is where they throw everything they don't know what it is. And that includes algae and the, the um, zooplankton that's tiny, like amoebas and paramecium and stuff. And they don't really look like they belong together, but that's because they don't know where to put them. But they're not plants and they're not animals and they're not bacteria or archaea. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. <laughs> Michael, I got a question. The Joe Coke. It says Judy Coke. That's my nickname. Uh, it's Joe Coke. Yes, Judy. Go ahead. Yeah. It's a, a stupid question. Okay. I did a lot of scuba diving when I was younger in the kelp forest. I noticed all those pods are like, what, two inches? You know, the little pods all over the stem? Yes. But, but I noticed on the beach sometimes you find these giant pods that must be six inches in diameter. Is this all from the same plant? I, it, it's hard to say. They could be. Uh, usually, I, I would think that the fronds and uh, whatever comes off of, a, of one of the kelp itself would be from one kelp uh, rather than from several kelp, different kelp. Uh, on the other hand, it's very possible that some kind of a storm or something came by and knocked it off of two or three or more individual plant, uh, kelp. Maybe I can help you with this. If you found a group of them together, it probably came from one individual kelp. Can you, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, maybe I could help you with this. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the macrocystis is basically the southern type of kelp. There is a bull kelp that is the kelp that's in the colder water. And the macrocystis extends roughly... Uh, as you head up towards San Francisco, they start blending in with a, with the bull kelp. Bull kelp is uh, a large, very large kelp. It has the large bulbs, the floats there. That's the only thing that floats it. Uh, and uh, if, if you just look it up, just Google it. Uh, uh, bull kelp. I it's some kind of nereocystis something. Is that the same genus as microcystis uh, periphera? Uh, but, it, but it's closely related. But it is an also it's an annual rather than a perennial. Okay, that's the, I would suggest just taking a look at uh, uh, googling that was it. That William uh, Owens. That yeah, was and yeah, you know, but you know, the storms break it loose and they just float. They just I have never seen it growing uh, in Southern California's water south of uh, Conception, right? So typically it's going to be to the north, but it will come down here when it breaks loose and drifts. Okay, that was my question. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Michael, I understand there was a uh, tremendous conservation story about giant kelp here in Palos Verdes. In the 60s, when we had the environmental disaster of the uh, toxic chemicals being leaked into the storm drains coming out of Point Furman and uh, covering uh, just about the entire uh, peninsula and just destroying all the kelp. And then uh, the uh, uh, California Fish and Game and others went out to Catalina and uh, in the uh, forest that uh, the glass bottom boats go over, they harvested a certain amount of those plants and took them uh, out here and reestablished them uh, with hold fast onto rocks for, around the peninsula. And as I understand it, about 20 to 25 years later, the, the, the kelp has completely grown back. It was kind of alarming for me to hear you say that 75% of the kelp has, uh, has gone uh, because uh, I was under the uh, uh, maybe false impression, I don't know, that uh, the kelp had come back in uh, tremendous terms. And, and if you look out from 
any of our vantage points, including our, our whale watching platform, <laughs> there's quite a bit of kelp in the water, even on the surface. So. Well, okay, here I go again. Uh, I'm of sufficient antiquity that I can uh, tell you uh, something about that. I was I started diving in 1966 before most of you were born, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, there was not one shred of giant bladder kelp on the Palos Fortis Valencia, Zippo. Uh, I was involved with the LA County Underwater Program, became an instructor and was in, in, engaged with them uh, from about 1970. Uh, and there was a called the Palos Verdes Underwater Recreation, uh, Restoration Project, PERC project, that you're describing as replanting the kelp. And I think in the cove, uh, I don't know what it is, Pelican Cove near uh, Marine Land at that time, uh, they were doing the planting and they were trying to uh, protect them from sea urchin. The, the difficulty was, of course, the sea urchins were whacking the kelp. Now, why is that? I am sure toxic chemicals could have had something to do with it, but just the general uh, load of uh, sewage full of nutrients had a patina on the bottom and the sea urchin could thrive, I wouldn't say thrive, survive, I should say, on that. And as soon as the little kelp plant would stick up its head, here comes the sea urchin. At that time, uh, the islands, of course, the urchins were fine out there. The natural cycle is the urchin eats the kelp. There's no kelp to eat. The urchin goes away. The kelp comes back. And it's sort of, you know, in the smaller areas. But the uh, sewage was blanketing the coast. It is it, The general sewage was a big problem, not merely the toxic. So when the sewer sewage uh, became, uh, what, the filtration became more effective, then that reduced that. What really eliminated the urchin was commercial harvesting. And I was uh, working with uh, agar seaweed at the time, which is one of the things I think that Michael was talking about. It's a very small red plant that grows only on the bottom in shallow water. And it will not grow where there is kelp because there's a light that gets to that level. Uh, and I was out there as the kelp began to return when the commercial sea urchin harvesting began. Uh, it just takes, a, the, the urchin is a very durable item. And it takes an awful lot of harvesting to get them down to the numbers where the uh, kelp can uh, survive. That's a whole big story in itself, but that's just generally the gist of it. So let me shut up here. <laughs>